My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello, thank you for joining me for another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. My guest today is Sandy Rodriguez. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Very correctly, David. Thank you. My Spanish is absolutely terrible. I can understand more than I can speak. Sandy, I know your background is extremely impressive, and I really found it intimidating, actually, to know where to begin. Um, I know you've been a reporter, I know you've been a TV presenter, and I know that you're an author. You've also done overseas work, too, I believe. Um, so could you please start with your background and what kind of led you to the point where we are today? Thank you so much. Well, yes, I think I have a background that is very varied. And in that regard, I see that uh, I can get along with many different types of people because I have been involved in many types of things. My um, career started um, when I became a co-editor for uh, one of the most influential newspapers in, in not only Mexico, but Latin America. That would be the Reforma newspaper. Uh, this was a place where I worked for over the course of over a decade and a half. And it was very interesting because I ended up doing so many different things at the new at the newspaper. I was hired originally as a co-editor for the fashion section and the food section, but it seems to me that it was only, I don't know, months in when my responsibility started growing and growing and growing and I started moving through the ranks. And uh, by the time that I was um, about ready to leave uh, about a decade and a half in, I had uh, really been involved with pretty much all of the areas of the newspaper that fall into the soft news category. That includes so many different things, entertainment, uh, environmental issues, certain types of businesses, uh, just a, a very, very wide variety of things. At the end, I was uh, my post was called editorial coordinator. I was the editorial coordinator for over 50 different publications featured within the magazine. Ma they were called supplements and they were like smaller magazines within the newspaper, I'm sorry. So um, that was that was very fascinating. That was a, a, a wonderful career path and also something that it was my, my passion. However, after a very lengthy time there, as I was mentioning, it was about 16 years. I noticed because of several personal situations that this had been my passion and my joy, but at the expense of literally everything else, everything else. I would be in the newsroom uh, normally 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day or beyond, 18 hours a day perhaps, when, uh, when work required that. And when you work in media, and I'm sure you can appreciate that, David, you're never really off a clock. If at any time you're driving home or you're uh, sneaking a quick meal, if something were to happen at that particular point, maybe breaking news or something that might happen, an earthquake, a shooting, um, anything, something that, that might be important, an election, Obviously, you need to go right back into the newsroom or at the very least place phone calls and assign things and decide things and meet with people. And it's something that really takes over your life. Now, I see that a lot of people are often eager to walk away from career paths that they don't like. That 
I mean, that sounds very obvious. It's very intuitive. But in my case, I felt the need to walk away from a career path that I did like, that I loved, that um, was really a very, very strong part of my identity. It was something that allowed me to be a, a very influential person on many levels. I was also making very good money, but more to the mm. point, this was something that sincerely uh, fulfilled me um, as a person and not only on a professional level. However, it really was done, David, to the exclusion of everything else, everything. Um, let me give you an example. Many things that people might take for granted that was simply not a choice for me. For instance, I would see my very best friends perhaps four times a year at best. Uh, I wow. never uh, dated or anything like that, nothing uh, in, in, as to romance or anything even remotely like that. Uh, certainly even things like, I remember this one time, it was quite funny. I was speaking with friends at, at the newspaper, co-workers of mine, my peers. And uh, I remember that particular day, the day before, I hadn't had the time to go to a stylist. So I had just trimmed my hair off with scissors because I couldn't have done anything. And my friend said, well, look at the bottom of my shoe. And he showed me the sole. It had a hole in it. And he said, I wanted to wear these shoes and I haven't had time to go shopping. So it was crazy because we were making a lot of money. We were these very glamorous people. And the reality is that we didn't have time for, for anything that other people might find uh, normal or natural. So, um, it wasn't, even after I, I realized this, it wasn't a very straightforward decision either. What happened then was that uh, I had to go through the very, very uh, trying situation of losing my father and then shortly after my younger brother. So of course that shook me to the core as you can certainly imagine. And I felt that I needed a different career path that would enable me to actually spend more time or spend some time with people that were important to me. So I made the decision, it wasn't an overnight thing certainly, but I made the decision that I wanted to move from Mexico City to somewhere that was uh, much more laid back. And Los Angeles, where I live now, definitely fit the bill because, well, firstly, it's also a city, I'm a city person. Uh, however, it's a far smaller city than Mexico City and the pace is just far uh, more calm. It's a much more relaxed place in, in my view. Yeah. So, so that makes a world of a difference, you can imagine. Now, the thing is that once I was here, I needed to find um, employment. And as it turns out at that particular point in time, bloggers and other content creators were really starting to become very popular. And as a content consumer, that was fantastic. But as a content creator, well, maybe not so much because uh, there really was not much motivation from companies at the time to pay uh, good money for uh, things that people were doing well and for free. So although I was invited to work in different media projects, they ended up being more like uh, fun activities or activities that allow me to connect with people perhaps, but not really uh, what one would consider gainful employment. So at the time, in order to, uh, well, make ends meet, to be quite honest, um, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of contacts in publishing and many people reached out for major publishing houses, seeing if I would be willing to translate uh, best-selling books. And of course, that was something that was very exciting. Um, and here's the thing for your viewers, if anybody is uh, looking to become a translator, I would strongly advise trying to see if they can eventually do that, translate uh, books. Firstly, because they're all going to be bestsellers from the start, because no major publishing house commissions translations of any book except for those that are proven to be greatly successful and that they also predict will be a wild success in in another uh, market with a different language. So you're going to get that experience of actually being involved with uh, material that is, uh, I mean, it's going to be very, very successful. Obviously your career will possibly skyrocket because you will be linked or your name will be linked at least on the credits page with uh, with these brilliant authors. So that's, that's quite interesting. Um, then um, after that, David, 
I was very happy doing that because it's it's exciting. And from a writer's perspective or an editor's perspective, such as myself, it was very fascinating. I felt that translating a book is very similar to being a method actor. When you're a method actor, you embody the role that you're going to play and you act as if you were that person. Well, when you're translating a book, it's very similar. You need to really put yourself in the author's shoes. And it's it's just very fascinating. They might be, I don't know, using humor, using acronyms, using poetry, different things. They might be using very high register words or quite the opposite, very low register words. So you need to actually envision yourself as being the author and just doing that as if you were them speaking through their own voice. And it's quite interesting, to be honest. So I did that for a while. And that's pretty much my um, the, what happened when I came here to LA. Now, when you were translating books from English to Spanish, and I would imagine from S Spanish to English as, as well, did you ever find any difficulties? Because I know if you look at some an author, for example, like the great Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, I could see how there could be difficulties in translating that from the native Chilean to English, losing some meaning, content being lost in translation. How did you deal with that as a translator? Well, it's really a tremendous challenge. That is also why very few translators are actually um, tapped to do something of this nature. And of course, uh, these already translated, let's say once they are translated, they go through a number of different uh, processes before actually seeing the light of day. But the reality is that poetry is tremendously challenging to to translate, but I think it might even be more difficult to translate things such as acronyms or humor. Humor is quite possibly the most difficult one. I did encounter one case where we had to do a total workaround. This was um, a small book of jokes, only jokes and riddles, uh, obviously featuring plays on words very heavily. And there's just no way that you can uh, actually use all of those when translating to a different language because they just don't work. So what we did is that we decided which ones, uh, well, I decided which ones could actually make sense if I adjusted them in some way or translated them in some way and which ones would simply not work. And those were replaced by something more uh, local specific. So that was a situation where it was just impossible by virtue of being plays on words. Now, you had mentioned that one of the books you translated, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was was it Conversations with God? Well, it was a companion book by the same author to the okay. series. It was a companion book that the author of the series wrote for the series. Um, I thought it was uh, very interesting, especially for me, seeing that I hadn't read any of the books in the series or had any idea of what they were about. So I think I came to the project with a with a fresh set of eyes, I, I think. And it really was very interesting, especially because this is a very lengthy book and it touches on a number of subjects. So as a, let's say as a translator or as a reader, it was quite interesting because it wasn't a book that was banging the same point home over and over again. And that is also a, a feature of some books, even if they are bestsellers. So this one I thought was entertaining in, in, uh, in many regards. And going to this thing that I was mentioning that some books really repeat the same idea over and over. I think it's um, a situation in which publishers might have very specific requirements as to page count or word count and a writer feels that they need to pad out something mm -hmm. in order to fulfill that requirement and often it does it doesn't work i mean it can still be a bestseller if the premise or the 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 story itself is interesting but i would say that as a reader and especially as a translator it's to me i don't enjoy that i don't enjoy reading the same thing over and over and over again. But it is quite interesting. There are very, very real reasons for that. Uh, and one of them is a marketing reason. 
of course, every book in the world has um, a spine, a spine on the book. So if a book is too short, it might be fabulously concise. It might be wonderful for the reader. They might be able to grasp a key concept very quickly and it would be fine. However, if the book is to be sold in physical stores, unless it's a super, super, super famous author with a giant platform, it's going to be shown um, from the side spine up, not, uh, not directly cover up. So the spine needs to be large enough to fit in the name of the author, the name of the publishing house, the title very prominently displayed. There might be design elements. So that's one of the main reasons where, uh, where you see the value of a book like the companion book to Conversations with God, that at least you have a, a wide, wide, wide variety of topics that it makes sense. And it's very reasonable to have a hefty tone rather than a, a slim, a slimmer book. Now, I want to ask your opinion, since you brought this subject up, of a physical book on the shelf at an actual bookstore. Uh, what do you see as the, well, what are your feelings, I should say, on self-publishing, considering what you've done? What are, you know, the positives and, and perhaps the, the negatives or downfalls or anything contrary to that? First and foremost, the industry is definitely moving in that direction and eventually there will be really not much distinction. Like in this day and age, there's really not a big difference between a blog by a hobbyist or a blog by a professional or a professional news outlet that is not blog heavy, let's put it that way. They're very similar, they're very similar in influence, they're very similar in content. And nobody looks down on a blogger these days. If anything, they can be massively influential, much more so than traditional media. So I think that that is something that over time might happen as well in publishing. At this time, I think that the stigma to self-publishing is almost gone, although there are remnants in the sense that there used to be this thing called vanity publishing, where you could just take anything and have somebody print it out for you. And that is not what we mean these days by saying uh, self-publishing. Of course, there are many predatory practices. And let's say that you write a book. There might be people that approach you and say, oh, I can make you a best-selling author. I can make you an award-winning author. I'm sure that you'll do wonderfully. Yes, 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 just bring me this thing and I can guarantee riches and fame and fortune. That's, that's really very predatory. It's normally uh, people that might charge you in the thousands or even tens of thousands for a book publishing package that is really not worth it. The reality is that you can have an excellent quality book that is self-published and you can have a terrible quality book that is uh, traditionally published. The quality should not uh, be uh, something that, that you feel is exclusive to traditional publishers. The thing that makes the biggest difference is, uh, in this day and age has nothing to do with quality of writing or little to do with quality of, of writing and more to do with size of platform. What I mean by this is that publishing houses, like every other industry, they don't want to lose money. They're not going to um, they're not going to bet on something that isn't really a sure bet. So the way it goes these days is that anybody with a massive platform, and by that I mean perhaps an extraordinary writer that has been very popular throughout the decades. Or it could even be uh, a YouTuber that has never written a book, but that has a following in the millions. All of these people are candidates for um, traditional publishing. And most likely they will have a, a very high quality uh, finished product. This is not always the case, mind you. It's the, it would be, let's say, more likely to be wonderful content than not to, but there are certainly exceptions. Because here, I mean, Yes, yes, the writing is a selling point for the final consumer, but the other selling point is who is the author? Is this somebody that has a lot of fans that will rush to bookstores? So that's that's important right there. Whereas uh, when it comes to self-publishing, um, many self-published authors can eventually become very rich. I mean, let me give you an example. That man that wrote Rich, man, Poor, uh, rich Dad, Poor Dad, was yes. self-published and I mean, that was a marketing genius. That was a man that really knew how to to um, to work self-publishing to his advantage. Yeah. So I do think that um, 
Self-publishing is a good option for certain people. They're useful for people that might be excellent writers, but that are not famous already. They can be useful for people that are looking to grow a business or expand their, their influence in some way. And they're useful for people that just want to explore their creativity and do something for fun or for themselves or for a very small audience, maybe something very niche that's also valuable. But the thing is that if you do choose the self-published route, you do need to ask yourself some hard questions first. Are you doing this just a, uh, as a passion project? Do you not care about the money part or do you care about the money part? Because depending on what it is that you want, that would need to guide your writing and it would need to guide your selection of topic. It would need to guide uh, a number of things, the angle you're going to be playing up, the cover you're going to select, um, it's just, it's just a, a number of things, but I would certainly say that the stigma against uh, self-publishing is for the most part, almost gone. Now that said, I also want to stress that neither um, self-published authors nor big, uh, big publishing house authors tend to sell as many copies as one would think. In fact, it's not tremendously difficult to become um, a best-selling author these days as it was, let's say, 40 years ago or 30 years ago or 20 years ago even, because now people do not tend to buy many, many books. In fact, I've, I've read a statistic. It could be a little bit too negative because I've also read some that are a little bit less, less terrifying, but it seems to be that out of the books published that are that actually have a, a code that says that, that the book exists, so that rules out maybe something that somebody printed out on, on their own uh, computer. Um, maybe 2% of those books are able to sell over 1,000 copies. Now you might say, okay, you're kidding. That's not true. You might say, okay, that's not, that can't be. I mean, anybody might assume if I write a book, I will certainly sell more than 1,000 copies. Well, guess what? You will not. Now that's, uh, that comes as a shock, but it's a true reality that in most cases that will not be the case. Mm -hmm. And you might say, but I see Down Brown says mil sells millions of copies or Stephen King or, you know, these best-selling authors. And that may be true, but they are total outliers. Publishing is very much like acting. Not everybody is a uh, Brad Pitt. Nobody, not everybody is an Oscar winner. Not everybody is a super famous uh uh, superstar. Most actors are are not. So so it's it's a similar a similar scenario, I think. Yeah, and I would add to that as well by saying that even uh, a famous author such as Dan Brown, uh, I seriously doubt that their first work was as popular as the second or third or subsequent uh, novels went on to be. You know, and they certainly don't start selling, even for those that are wildly popular, they don't come out and they begin selling tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands right away. Could take years to begin gaining momentum. Let me ask you about your own book. Can you get into what motivated you first to write your book originally? and what the purpose of that was originally. And the second part of that would be, did you ever experience writer's block or self-doubt about writing your first book? Well, let me tell you, uh, maybe going from the back of your question to the front of your question. Sure. Um, I, I think I couldn't let myself experience writer's block because I'm, versed in the world of journalism. So when you're a journalist, you can't really say, oh, I would like to wait for the news. You really need to set a deadline for yourself and complete whatever needs to be completed. So I actually created artificial deadlines for myself so that I could move forward. That's and what I was going to ask you. <laughs> I was going to ask you that that was right on the tip of my tongue because I was a reporter for several newspapers and everything that you said in your, your journey was extremely accurate and, and comparative to my experiences too. You had no time, although the newspapers I worked for, the pay was very low. Mm -hmm. 
So you're on call 24 seven, you could get a call at 3 a.m. telling you to go cover some hurricane or some traffic accident down the street from you. Um, so yeah, you have those deadlines, but I found it very difficult to apply the daily deadline to, to a novel as an example, because you don't have someone holding you accountable, standing over you saying, I need this on my desk by 5 p.m. How did you manufacture that? Well, let me tell you, I, I think I need to go a little bit back so that people can see why I actually had to create these deadlines. Um, so what happened after I was um, a few months uh, in to the, with the book translation activities that I was doing when I moved here, um, I kind of fell into a career path that I didn't even know existed, which is court interpreting. I wasn't even aware of that. I don't think I had ever seen the inside or maybe even the outside of a courthouse. But I discovered that there was this potential career path that I thought, okay, that sounds like something I would really enjoy. And it also sounds like something I would be very good at because everybody has their own skill set. And this felt like a very natural match for me. And as it turned out, it was, and I became a full-time court interpreter at one of the two largest courthouses in the world, which is actually where I work right now. So I hold a full-time job, and it's also a very demanding job by any standards. But as you very well expressed, when you have worked in journalism, it seems like a walk in the park because you're not going to be on call 24 hours a day because you will, uh, let's say it's 5 uh, p.m. and then you just sleep. You just walk out the door, which is not what you would do when you're working in media. So uh, for me, even though my coworkers might say, oh, it was a very grueling day, and I can't say that they're wrong. I mean, it's a very high stakes, high responsibility job, but it does finish when it finishes and nobody's going to call you at 3 a.m. or anything like that. So, um, so that was great. But the thing is that Again, I'm very, very used to working all the time, or it's something that I actually enjoy. Um, so my days also started getting filled up with other activities because people reached out to me. They wanted me to um, to host uh, videos as a video interviewer, or they wanted me to help them out with writing projects or different things. And uh, normally, I, I'm happy to help if it's an interesting project, of course. So I ended up doing like a lot of freelance activities in addition to my full-time job. So writing a book was really not something that was front and center of my mind because I really didn't have the time. Um, I needed to also make time to socialize and to do the very things that I had wanted to do when I moved here. So really my, my schedule was kind of a little bit too, too packed for, for any kind of of the writing of a book. However, when COVID started, not to say that there's anything good to be gained from COVID, it's been a horrible thing for sure. Um, I did stay home for maybe a few months, not, not throughout the pandemic, certainly not. In fact, I was very eager to get back to in-person work. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did have to stay home because, well, I mean, the courthouse shut down for a couple of months there. So I felt this is the one time in my lifetime that I will ever have the time to write a book if that's something that I want to do. So it's now or never. Good point. And, right? Yeah. So I really said, I mean, they were artificial deadlines in the sense that no one was cracking a whip and, or anything like that. However, uh, they were not entirely artificial because I, I knew, okay, I'm going to have to go back to work very, very soon. Uh, so let's get, let's get moving. So although it was a project that I had kind of started on uh, two years prior, it had been something that I had put on the back burner. I hadn't really come back to that until COVID. And then I said, no, it's now or never. And I really, really plowed uh, through. And I think that, well, I made it in the nick of time right before I, I had to go back to work. It was already being um, not, it was actually, yes, already uh, in its pre-launch stage by the time I went back to work. So I really had to hurry up and it, it, it worked well. It's something that I had begun, let's say, 
thinking about in my mind. I already knew what I wanted to write. I wanted what I wanted the book to contain. It was just a matter of actually putting pen to paper, you know, that was all. Okay, so you really didn't experience a great deal of um, self-doubt or, or writer's block per se. Well, I think I didn't feel any self-doubt and not to say that, oh, I'm the best writer in the world and everybody's going to love what I wrote. No, of course not. And different people have different tastes, different strokes for different folks. But here's the thing. I never experienced self-doubt as a writer and I would encourage everyone not to experience self-doubt as a writer either, because here's the thing. Normally when we write something, let's say a magazine article, a book, newspaper article, blog post, even, we might think, oh, I'm not as good as everybody else. I mean, I've read books, I've read newspapers, I've read, um, you know, different types of content and they're fantastic. My writing cannot compare. Well, here's the thing. You're not comparing your first draft to their first draft. You're comparing your first draft to somebody's highly, highly, highly polished writing that has already been through a number of uh, revisions and edits and pair of supplies. Uh, to be honest, I've seen the raw work of uh, very well-known writers and authors and journalists, and some are great and some are not. I mean, it's really, mm -hmm. it's not that they don't know how to do it. It's just that everybody sometimes writes in a hurry or they might be doing something, but they're, you know, preoccupied with something else or there, there might be factors. Not everybody's writing is fantastic from the start. That's one thing. So you need to understand that a first draft will always be terrible. That's just the nature of what a first draft is. You're not supposed to do something that's fantastic from the start because it just won't be. And it's just putting too much pressure on yourself. So I would encourage people to just go for it. I mean, if you're looking to write a book or a magazine article, in fact, it would be better to start with a magazine article, start small. Um, don't even worry about the first draft because nobody's going to see it but you. You should not be comparing it to the best work from published authors because again, you don't really know the full scope of the editing process that went into that. And once you finish your first draft, set it aside, reread it. You can personally change things, re-edit, do the spelling, do the grammar, add little stories, add, uh, remove what doesn't need to be there, remove any um, padding that, that doesn't uh, make your writing sparkle. And have it looked at by another pair of eyes. Uh, if you don't want to do this professionally, maybe a, a, a friend that's a good writer, maybe they can have a, another look. And I think that you will feel so much more confident just in knowing that that is the case normally. And secondly, bear in mind that different people have different tastes. Not everybody, go go find a, a fantastic bestseller that most people you know love. Look at it on, you know, wherever you buy your books, Amazon or wherever the case may be and look through the reviews. They might have thousands of five-star reviews, but they will also have plenty of zero-star reviews, one-star reviews, two-star reviews, and scathing reviews saying, I hated this book. It was horrible. It was very poorly written. I didn't like it. So again, that's the thing. And this really should not affect your, um, your confidence in your product if you really did your best because different people like different things. Now, what motivated you to write your first book? What was the inspiration for that? Okay, this is a book that I wanted to write for, um, let's say, people I know that are going through a dip in self-confidence mostly. What I wanted the, the reader to achieve after reading this uh, slim book that is meant to be read over the course of an afternoon, I wanted them to feel both much more self-confident and also with much, much, much more faith in the future. So those were the two main things that I wanted to share with people because I think that I personally have experienced a lot of setbacks, personal tragedy, uh, traumatic incidents. I've been a crime victim. I've been, uh, you know, like a newcomer to a new town, you know, a number of things that really have required a lot of trust both in the future, the fact that things will work out uh, and also in yourself. So I thought that personally, I was able to use a couple of tips and tricks that I've discovered. Uh, many things that I have tried haven't worked, if you have. So I wanted to share that with people and also inspire them on their own journey of 
self um, exploration and coming up with solutions that work for them personally when confronted with challenges, uh, big and small. Also in the past, I was a very, very shy person. I was tremendously self-conscious. And I think that sadly, that is something that still plagues many, many people. So I felt that a book that would help strengthen people's confidence both in themselves and in the world that we live in, especially in these scary times, I thought that that would be useful and hopefully uh, people like it. It has, it has had a, a very good response from readers. In fact, I just won um, an award from a, an association called the International Latino Authors, Latino Society of Authors. So I won um, uh, one of their um, medals for having one of the best books in the wellness and, and um, health category. So that was wonderful. Well, congratulations on that. Um, let me ask you, I've got so many questions here. Well, let me ask you about self-help books in general. And I don't know if you would consider your book to be that category. So I want to ask you about the category for your book, what category you would assign to it, but also how do you feel about most books that, that may be in that genre? That's a very interesting question. I have had to categorize it differently um, depending on who I'm speaking with, but I do see that many booksellers chose to uh, group it in the self-help category. Now, I had my second thoughts about that because much like uh, what we were talking about with self-publishing, that there might still be some uh, stigma against that, there might also be some stigma as to the self-help category, and that goes for all publishers and all authors. But again, I think that that is something that is firstly not as true now than at other points in history. Firstly, because um, right now mental health is a very big topic and many people are massively open about that. It's something that actually, in many cases, it adds to their brands because people uh, admire those that have overcome or that are working day by day to overcome a challenge as to their mental health. So that's something that enables people to feel more confident when walking into a bookstore and requesting uh, to know where the self-help section is. They might not need to be like shy about it, right? So that's that's one thing. Then the other thing is that what do what really counts as self-help? Because for example, if you uh, get down to it, um, any uh, treat, uh, any uh, dissertation written by a philosopher, in the end, it is a self-help book. It's a book that is going to focus on mindset or give pointers on how to live a, a better life or a healthier or more balanced life. Um, many would argue that many religious tomes can be considered self-help. I mean, not to be, um, let's say, um, in any way disrespectful, but the thing is that if you want to say, okay, what book will help me? I mean, you can glean self-help lessons from a novel. You can, um, you can derive help from uh, pretty much any book. So saying, okay, we're only going to place the, what we consider the cheesier types of books here in the self-help book section. It really doesn't do anybody any good because that's, that's uh, very discriminatory against certain types of authors. And besides people like what they like. So, I'm not super crazy about having it categorized as self-help. However, that is a category that many booksellers uh, have selected for it. Uh, as for the readers, people that have read the book, some do uh, mention that they feel that it's a self-help book. Some people say that they feel that it's a philosophy book slash self-help book slash memoir. I thought that was funny and interesting. But the reality is that this is a book that reads like a conversation. What most people that have read it have mentioned and they say so online when you look through the reviews the thing that comes up time and time again is that people feel as if they were sitting down to a conversation with their friend maybe they're sharing a cup of coffee maybe they're sharing a glass of wine but they're just 
sitting there hanging out with their friend and it's a very supportive friend that is giving them the encouragement they need to get over whatever is causing them grief. So that's basically the experience that I wanted the reader to have. You know, that's actually, I think, a good point to me personally, many books in the self-help category, which basically they're trying to help the reader. So I don't think it's really inaccurate. They're trying to help the reader through something. And like you said, it could be a memoir, it could be a biography or biographic. But many in that category seem somewhat impersonal as if the the expert or the author is in this ivory tower uh, is like a magical guru. And they're basically telling the reader, well, this is what's wrong. This is what you need to do to fix the problem and be like me. You know, so I like the perspective that you said of maybe saying that to the reader, let's sit down for a cup of coffee uh, so that the imparted information can maybe be uh, taken in or, or seen as more helpful and more relevant to them, maybe. I think so. I feel that what I personally don't like about very traditional self-help books, although some people do like that, is that they tend to be very prescriptive. Like yeah. Do a and you will get to point B, right? And the reality is that in many cases it could help, but it's really uh, a crapshoot. I mean, you really don't know if it will or if it won't. Uh, different people are in different situations. And what works for someone, what might not work for someone else, of course. So mine is really more, more of a starting point than uh, than an actual prescription. If we were to compare something more traditional to this, I might say that the other one is a uh, GPS leading you to a specific uh, point, and mine is more like an old-fashioned map that just shows different types of routes that you might care to explore, and that will give you some amount of of uh, agency as to where you want to to travel to next. Now, when you wrote your book before you started the actual writing process did you come up with an outline yes uh, as i was mentioning this is a project that let's say began to take shape two years ago well actually more because the book is, has been out for a, a long time now so it was almost three years ago that i was uh very very clear on what i wanted to write i was thinking um that I wanted, firstly, I didn't want a book that had any filler. Because again, especially as a translator, I felt that sometimes books really could do with a, a heavy uh, extra edit, pair of editing eyes. But uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to remove any, any, any filler and that will allow me to have a compact book. And it will even allow me to touch upon a lot of different subjects. And also, here's the thing, David, a lot of my friends are strapped for time. I know I am. And I thought, I don't really want to write a 400 page book because my friends will not really read it. And, and, and I want people to read it. I want it to actually be helpful. So I thought, okay, 100 pages is reasonable. It's reasonable because nobody can say, oh, that was excessive. I didn't have the time. That's a reasonable enough uh, length that people can actually read it in an afternoon comfortably or maybe in a couple of afternoons. And that's that's it. So what I did was that firstly, I limited myself to that um, to that page count. So I had a lot of topics that I wanted to write about, not to compare it in any way to uh, the book that I was mentioning about the author of Conversations with, with God, which was the companion guide, or maybe a Tim Ferriss book that he likes to include a lot of, of topics in his books. I wanted to do something that was kind of like that, not because I have any uh, specific similarity between any of these authors, but I did want a book that included a lot of different topics so that the reader could easily see, okay, this one is of interest to me, but this one is not, so I'll just go to the one that works for me. Uh, and I'll just keep the book around. So whenever I have another issue, I can go back to the book. So it'll be kind of like a mini reference type of material. That's what I wanted to do. But when I said I need to keep it at 100 pages, I really had to pick and choose. Okay, what topics am I keeping? Which ones can I just not keep? Because I don't want to have like one paragraph per topic, right? 
Uh, so maybe that was the harder part, just deciding which ones to leave out. But um, in the end, it was good that, that I had a long time to think it through because even though I didn't have time to actually sit down at the computer and actually write the book, it was very clear in my head what I wanted to do. And I had two years to kind of figure out, okay, what am I actually committing to paper and what was interesting, but it just won't fit the, the, the theme. So I had a lot of different things that I wanted to talk about, but I ended up only selecting the ones that have to do with overcoming a challenge of some sort. And that's what, what I kept. Okay. Is there any particular type or method for marketing the book when it's been written? Is there a procedure that you recommend people follow? You know, for example, not everyone may have the financial resources to go to a publisher. What do you suggest? There are many things that one needs to, in my case, to be honest, I didn't really follow this advice. I followed, uh, let's say, every step that I would recommend, except for one. The one step that, in theory, needs to be taken before you even begin writing, if you want to actually market the book efficiently and, ma and make money off of the book, is have a very, very specific audience in mind. It has to be one specific type of person. And ideally, it should be kind of niche. For example, if you say, I am marketing this to um, parents that are uh, single parents that also need to travel for work often, that is a small enough niche that it would work very well. Or you might say, I'm going to market this to uh, DJs that don't know how to make money from their craft efficiently when dealing with uh, promoters, for example. That's also niche enough that it would be very well, uh, well selected. The reason uh, this is uh, normally brought up for people that actually want to make money is that firstly, you will be topping your category very quickly because there are not many books written about that. And if somebody has a problem and is Googling something around those lines, they will find your book right away and there's no competition really. And you already have like a very specific uh, group that you're going to be marketing to. Ideally, you would make friends with them well in advance so that, for example, let's say that you wanted to market a book for runners with bad knees that plan on completing half marathons or whatever. Before you actually put that out there, you would already even be involved in many athletic leagues. You might have made friends with chiropractors or people that might be uh, recommending this to their patients. You know, it's a, it's a situation where you would have to kind of start marketing prior to actually writing. So and it's you would directly to relevant to what you do on a daily basis. So for example, mm -hmm. if I were working with business owners in the space of digital marketing, writing a book about that topic would be relevant and then make it easier to market because I already know these people. I could actually uh, email existing clients and say, hey, I've written this book. You should read it. It may be very beneficial to you. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And maybe you're a professional speaker or you're already teaching a course or a class. You could say, okay, this is required reading. And there you go, you unload a lot of books on, on, on a big, big audience. So in reality, that is, that is uh, something I would sincerely recommend from a marketing perspective. However, I did not take my own advice because my main goal was not to make money off of this. It really wasn't, it was the last thing from my mind. I only wanted to write the book uh, for, for fun, to be honest, and also to, as I was saying, offer something that might make the reader feel more confident in more ways than one. Uh, because these are things that, that I would have found useful if I had read about them when I was going through um, a tremendous lag in confidence. So I felt that it would be useful. So what that means is that my book is not written for a specific type of person struggling with a specific type of problem. So in a way that was a poor marketing 101 for me, but um, I did uh, find benefits to going this other route. Firstly, that I discovered readers that I never would have discovered. As it turns out, this book uh, has been popular among mostly males, more men than women. And interestingly enough, younger men, or let's say uh, Gen X men, possibly, and most of them in media and finance. So it's quite interesting. For example, uh, a friend of mine that works uh, in investments, 
he is now offering a copy of my book to the first 1,000 investors in a specific, uh, uh, what, what is it? It's um, investing in precious timber and wood in uh, trees, in forestry. Whoever joins uh, that particular program will be receiving a copy of the book. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't seem like a very natural tie-in. It doesn't. And I couldn't have predicted it. I certainly couldn't have planned for it. It's something that just happened because uh, this uh, person enjoyed the book. They found value in the book and they feel that their clients will do the same. So that's that was wonderful. Yeah. And for for some reason, that particular person feels that the book is relevant to the needs of their clients. Uh, I have to ask you on the basis of just curiosity, when you moved to your current location in the US, what if any differences did you notice in terms of culture um, across the board, if any? Sure, that's a very good question. I, um, I've lived in many different places. I was uh, randomly born in Puerto Rico because my parents are architects, but they were getting there master's degrees in urban planning in Puerto Rico as newlyweds. So that's where I happened to be born. So that was uh, a place where I spent a few months. <laughs> then uh, my family uh, moved to Philadelphia. So I actually grew up uh, as a child in, in Philadelphia. Then um, I moved to Mexico City, which is where I lived the bulk of my life, except for a brief period that I lived in, in Seoul in South Korea. And then it was a few years ago that I moved here to LA. So I do have the experience of living in different places. And what strikes me is that in general, there are more similarities than differences, no matter where you are. And that also might include um, Seoul, but that is provided you're in big cities. Uh, I think that it might be very jarring for somebody that is, let's say from a small, town in the US to move to crazy Mexico City or Tokyo or something like that, or LA. Uh, and it also might be very crazy for somebody that comes from a little village in Mexico to move to New York or LA or Chicago, because that's a very big difference. It's a very big jump. When it comes to uh, cities in general, there's not too much of, uh, of a difference. Most people enjoy the same types of music, same types of clothing, same types of food, same uh, trends in general. So there's not uh, much of a difference in that regard. However, when I moved here, I did feel like a fish out of water and I still do in many regards. Uh, as to the little things, it's very strange. For example, one of the things that I even mentioned in the book that made me feel like so tremendously inadequate <laughs> was that, of course, I mean, I moved here as an adult, so I had been driving for many years, of course. But when I moved here, I just couldn't get on freeways because I found them terrifying. I sincerely felt that I would die, that I would die because, um, and this is the weird part, and this just shows how different two cultures might be. My LA friends are always saying, oh, this place is just so full of traffic. The freeway is like a parking lot. This is horrible. And I'm thinking, what? Okay, the reason I freak out or freaked out on freeways is that to me, there is almost no traffic. I mean, in Mexico City, now that is traffic. Yeah. The traffic here, honestly, David, when I'm on the freeway, I feel like uh, like I'm racing in the NASCAR circuit or flying a plane. To me, it feels like a crazy high speed, even though it might not be or not be from another person's perspective. But when you're in bumper to bumper traffic, which is the norm in Mexico City, and you're here doing what's 80 miles an hour or whatever, I feel like I'm going to pass out. So that was something that I simply could not deal with. And in fact, that's also uh, something that I mentioned in, in the book and choose to prevail. I mentioned how I was able to actually overcome that phobia. Mm. And I maybe people might think, well, that's a silly phobia. I mean, what's uh, what, what's the difficulty? But that's the thing. In, because of the cultural differences, to me, that was something that was terrifying. Right. It's and, not silly at all if you, if it's something that you're not accustomed to or comfortable with doing. You know, I know a lot of people are uh, uncomfortable driving. That makes, you know, it's really not that big a deal. Exactly. And the way that I was able to overcome it uh, was actually 
very well i mean i, I don't necessarily want to offer a spoiler but basically um i was going through a very difficult time at that time um i had had a personal setback that had left me in a state of you know deep deep sadness profound sadness so i thought that it would be a good time to try to drive on the freeway because if you're super sad you cannot be super terrified at the same time you're either super sad or super terrified you can't be both so i figured okay now that i feel super sad i think i won't feel terrified and of course i didn't feel terrified because the sorrow was just overwhelming overwhelming enough to allow me to do this in a comfortable manner and eventually the sorrow lifted the situation uh, was resolved but by then i had been able to uh just get enough practice that the actual phobia of driving on freeways disappeared as well. So, well, that was a, an example of turning lemons into lemonade. Absolutely. Well, I only have one other question for you. How do you recommend as the author of Choose to Prevail that average people in general, or perhaps people who, who would be good readers uh, for Choose to Prevail, how do you recommend they deal with recovering from self-doubt, stressful events, or even traumatic events? I think one of the things to keep in mind is that we need to be very gentle on ourselves. I think that everybody is way harsh. It's, it's crazy. The thing is that when we see other people, we might assume that they don't suffer from any self-doubt or we might assume that their lives are just wonderful because we see them and we think I would like to be in their shoes. I mean, for them, everything is so easy. They lead this charmed life and, and that leads to a lot of, of self-doubt because you think, well, they're doing very well financially and I'm struggling or they're doing, they have a wonderful family situation and I don't, or they're very talented at this and they're great at everything they do. And I, on the other hand, am not good at everything that I do. And we feel that we are uniquely um, at a disadvantage. But the reality is that something that really creates a mind shift is really getting uh, clear on the fact that everybody is going through something, everybody faces challenges, everybody experiences, sadly, tragedy or sorrow. There's just no way around that. But uh, also everybody, no matter how bad things might be, they also have some moments of joy, some things to be grateful for. I think that with very, a uh, few exceptions, if at the end of our lifetime, we were to average out all the good and all of the bad that we experienced, we would all kind of be in the same boat. It does tend to, to, to happen that way. So I think that's something that should give us some solace. Um, understand that even people that we see that we think, oh, but I mean, I saw their beautiful car, their beautiful home. Maybe they have a secret struggle that we can't see. Maybe they're deeply in debt, for example or maybe they're struggling with a health issue. Then again, maybe we are struggling with a health issue and we feel uh, jealous of somebody that we see that's the paragon of health. Well, maybe they just got a divorce. Maybe they have uh, some, uh, I don't know, crippling phobia that we're unaware of. So it's, it's, it's very important to notice that we are not uniquely tortured. Everybody has something, sadly, uh, that is not going well. So that should give us some confidence in, in that regard. Not everybody is uh, doing great. So for example, if you think, if I uh, go on stage and I give a talk, I'm obviously going to blush and stammer and it'll be horrible, I'll do terribly. Well, I think that that's a thought that goes through pretty much everybody's mind at some point in time. So you shouldn't feel like, oh, I'm this terrible public speaker and everybody is so confident. No, the reality is that everybody has their own moments of self-doubt. There are different moments for everyone, but we're all going through the same things. Very true. Uh, I, I just wanted to interject that I remember in my own uh, case, when I first taught at the college level, I was extremely nervous. And I don't have a master's degree. I have a bachelor's degree in English. And I was extremely nervous, but I wanted to teach at the college level because A, I thought it would be enjoyable for me. And, and, you know, and plus it was a good position with other benefits. And anyway, I went to a more experienced professor. Uh, and I remember saying to him, you know, I'm really nervous. I've never taught at the college level before. 
I can't help this feeling that they're going to know everything that I know because they're college students. I just have this BA in English. And he said, I'll never forget. He said, you think they know these things, but they don't. They haven't graduated yet. They haven't any real professional experience that you do. And uh, so they're there to learn from you. And and he actually let me teach as like a substitute or fill in for his own literature class at the college level. And so he would sit in the back of the classroom and grade papers while I taught at the front of the class for him. So he basically got me to fill in for him for free while he sat in the back and did his own work. Uh, but it, he was absolutely correct. It, it really floored me that I would get up and talk about subject matter in the course, expecting them to already know about it. And the reality is that, that, that they didn't. So it was a huge help and made me more comfortable with teaching at the college level, which I went on to do for a few years after that. So thank you so much for your time, Sandy. I really appreciate it. For those who want to get a copy of Choose to Prevail or perhaps learn more about you, how can they uh, best get in touch? Thank you so much. I would uh, be delighted if anyone would care to follow uh, me um, as an author on Instagram. The handle is at Choose to Prevail. And if they would care to buy a copy of Choose to Prevail, either a physical copy or an ebook co copy, that's available, fortunately, in, I'm guessing, in pretty much any uh, online retail outlet that sells books. It could be Amazon, that would be the easiest way. But if they want to go to Target.com, Walmart.com, BarnesandNoble.com, they, they will also find the book there available for them. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Sandy, and please have a great rest of your day. Thank you, David. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.